It's my pleasure and my privilege to introduce this evening's session, Just Politics, Perspectives from Emerging Leaders. And having listened to a number of our ecumenical friends as our keynote speakers uh, this weekend, we have looked within our own National Justice and Peace Network for tonight's contributors, with the aim of strengthening, strengthening our own next generation of leaders, both those you can see here on the panel and others who are also in the room. And we're going to be learning from their wisdom. My name is Colette, Colette Joyce, and I am the Justice and Peace Coordinator for the Diocese of Westminster, and I make it a particular passion and priority of mine to focus on young adult formation, or particularly perhaps post-confirmation formation, that chance once it becomes optional for people to opt in to their Catholic lives and to support and nurture young people in that. Now, I am not a young person, and this often comes as a bit of a surprise to people, it's not actually always that easy to identify who the young people are in a church where many more priests and parishioners than ever before are in their 70s, 80s and 90s. It's not that we've lost our young people, I often tell people, it's that we've got a lot more older people, which is a good thing because we're all living longer, but it makes it harder for young people to break through. So something of tonight is about being deliberate and intentional to make sure those voices get heard early and you don't have to wait till you're in your 50s, 60s or 70s before you get to speak. Um, in Westminster Diocese we sadly lost the much loved priest Father Dominic McKenna this year and many people were very upset that we'd lost one of the young ones. He was 73. <laughs> Two years off retirement and that was considered, and was indeed, a great tragedy. I was in my mid-30s when I first came to conference and at that point, I was already managing a refugee day centre, nearly 20 years ago. So how long does it take to stop being a young person at conference, never mind anywhere else in the church? And there's a great need to take a certain care, I think, with our language, because it's become commonplace to refer to the young people and mean both children and younger adults. I sometimes hear people talk about young people and then talk about going into schools. I'm like, okay, they are young people, but children are a different entity to young adults. All our panellists here are over 18, and as over 18s, they may be young, but they are adults, full adults, capable to take full part in our civic life, including, of course, voting in and indeed standing for elections. And I'm often reminded that Jesus began his public ministry at the age of 12, adulthood in his community at the time, and he completed it by the age of 33. The group who gathered round him would have looked something similar to the panel we have here tonight. So here we see something of the energy from which the early church emerged, and which, from which the church of our day continues to emerge. And it's incumbent on us to listen to their contribution. The group have formed their own questions and their own programme, so I'm now going to hand over to Michael to chair. Um, and as I do that, I'm going to introduce the panel to you. So wave when I call your name. Uh, so Eleanor Marshall, first of all, is 18 years old. You might remember her starting Pockets for Peace at conference, her, her early um, foray into social action a couple of years ago. She was also one of the first people to receive a Faith in Action Award in her diocese. She's just finished her A-levels and will be doing a gap year in youth work. Then we have Chucks, who's kindly let me off pronouncing his full name. He volunteers for CAFOD and is a part of Spark in Leeds. He advocates for climate justice and cares for the elderly in his spare time. And it's his third time here at conference. We have Anna Barrett, who is working as a sustainability lead in a secondary school in Berkshire. She studied horticulture and plant science at the Eden Project and it's also her third time at conference. Hannah Lomagin. Welcome, Hannah. Hannah is a Faith in Action volunteer with the Columbans, and she's currently spending a lot of her time working with people with lived experience of seeking sanctuary, and she's based in Birmingham. Anna Marshall is currently studying philosophy and theology at Oxford University. She's delivered social action days in schools, and you all know her as one of the musicians in the band, along with sister Eleanor, for a good many years. 
We have Michael Archibald from the Diocese of Hexham and Newcastle, well known to many of us. He came to his first conference at the age of five, and he's now working with elder people in physiotherapy. We have Garrett Orr, welcome Garrett. He's 19 and his dad is Steve. <laughs> so now over to Michael. Is this thing on? Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Talet, and thank you, John, for those introductions. Um, so I was, I was talking to my friend the other day about this panel, and I said um, that it was going to be on the Saturday evening of the NJPN conference. Um, and she said to me, so is it, a, is it one of the main sessions? Like, is everyone going to be there? And I said, yeah. And she went... So you're basically Coldplay at Glastonbury. <laughs> and I laughed and I said, yeah, and now I'm thinking that does, does that mean the Columbans are our supporting act? <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, so thank you for the introductions. Um, and um, so some of you may know me already, um, but if you don't, I'm Michael. I've been attending the NJPN conferences since 2020. My first one was that online one. Uh, I work for Million Minutes, Catholic Youth Agency, and have done since August last year. So just coming up to a year now. As an organisation that works for and with young people, as of Million Minutes, we find ourselves being asked, where are all the young people? A view that whilst stemming from concern around low church attendance also reflects this kind of misconception that young people and young adults are disinterested in or disengaged with current affairs. So at the beginning of this year, with the help of Pax Christi, we launched a new six-step program called Celebrating Young People Revival, aimed at engaging and resourcing Catholic schools to help encourage and empower youth voice. We did this in order to enter into an open conversation with young people where we could understand where they were coming from. With the knowledge that the voices of young people, meaning those aged 11 to 18, are often at risk of going unheard in many spaces throughout society, the first step of this programme was to, to listen. Get that? It took the form of a questionnaire that we sent around to seven schools. And these pupils filled out this questionnaire during form time as homework or in core RE classes. In response, we received powerful insight into the experiences of young people and where they are. So before we jump into this discussion with my wonderful panel here, I would like to go through some of the results of the questionnaire that Million Minutes pulled together after this period of listening. I would urge you, however, to take these statistics, if you could even call them that, with a pinch of salt. Because it's not necessarily these results that matter, with it being such a small sample size, but rather that really we're doing what no one else is doing. Not to pat myself on the back or anything. <laughs> The first question we asked was, what are the top three issues affecting your communities? The theme of conflict ranked the highest, with sentiments around war and desire for peace coming up most, with the conflict following October 7th running in the news almost continuously when we sent round this questionnaire. Perhaps if we had run the questionnaire just a few weeks ago, or when we go to run it next year, it might look totally different. Well-being, which covered a wide range of topics, including happiness, love, joy, safety and security, basic needs and family support, came second. And issues surrounding equality, such as racism, bigotry and prejudice, discrimination and inclusion, came third. The other notable themes that came up were financial issues, environment and animals, crime, and health. Then we also ask these young people to think about those issues that they just named. And thinking about 
whether they, as young people right now, believe they could make a difference. Almost 70% said yes, they could, followed by 26% saying no, they couldn't, and 6% not providing an answer to the question. Now we asked more questions, but I, I just want to stop here at, at this one. The question was, how much do you think the church cares about the voice of young people? Around 47% say the church cares a lot. Another 47% say the church cares a little. And the remaining 6% says the church doesn't care at all. Now you might, you might feel that this question is a bit too specific to the Catholic context, with it being centred around the church. But... I would just like to reflect on what church might mean to young people, to these young people in Catholic schools. The church probably means figures of authority. It might mean their parish priest, their bishop, it might be their teacher, their head teacher, it might even be the Pope, local and global leaders. What happens if we swap out the church to the government? Would the results of 47% a lot, 47% a little, and 6% not at all look the same? Or do you think they would look a bit different? Now, with all of that in mind, I'm going to transition over to our panel of young adults here, where I'll be asking them a handful of questions and then we'll take some questions from you, our audience, and hopefully we'll be done before 10. I know how these things tend to run on. Okay, so, question number one. What from the conference have you learned so far, and what has challenged you? Start off easy. Don't all rush to go first. <laughs> What from the conference have you learned so far and what has challenged you? Um, hi everyone. So from the conference, I think um, the Lord Bishop made a very nice intro yesterday and that really set the pace for me. Um, the, the true reflection on just qualities, which is qualities we should be pure and we should be um, qualities where our leaders should be able to harness the challenges which we are asking them to solve, rather than um, maybe looking at the speaker or whoever is um, presenting those challenges, or try to solve the challenges with which, which um, the constituents, the people, the voices of the masses have raised. And in all the sections and the workshops um, this morning, in the afternoon, we've seen different groups um, buttress on those points and try to um, talk about them and in my conversation with the young people um, everyone I've shared tables with in different um, times of uh, meal time I've really seen people who are passionate, people who really want to see change happen, people who want to see this body not passed down to young people but seeing it solved before I mean during their lifetime Thank you I think similarly to what you said, I think I found it really inspiring and hopeful that there are people that care about the issues that I do and that my peers do across generations and it's been really valuable for me to have those conversations with um, such a wonderful group of people. I think I found that most valuable so far. I think what's uh, struck me particularly this conference is I was and a chat that Paul Southgate about this, I think we've really seen a sort of like professionalisation of the conference. Um, I mean, after the fact that we had like a you know, former MP, a board, and just like a number of you folks who've been involved in all sorts of like activism and even research, uh, it's, it's been really great to see. Um, and 
I think what I take home from it is just how important this like network continues because both from ourselves here on the panel and yourselves, through that networking, like we can create like really, really effective change. And I know for me, that's always what keeps me coming back to conference is the sort of opportunity to like carry out those good works and just with having yourselves there, I think that's like a huge part of the reason. Um, so it's, it's just nice to see that continue to happen. challenged me was right back at the start on the Friday night um, talking about shared language and I think that's an issue that we've all kind of discussed in our free time as well um, be it from labels do we call ourselves Catholics what does that mean um, is it something that the world recognizes around us um, does it mean what we want it to mean does it mean something else um, so even something as simple as calling ourselves a Catholic um, isn't a shared language that, well even between us, we, we couldn't find what that means. Um, and I know there's, I'm, I'm sure it's the same for all of you. Um, so I think that's a massive challenge for, for us to kind of, that, that shared language idea is, keeps coming back to me. Um, and the more I think about it, the more it challenges me to try and work out, is there something in common? Um, and what what is that? Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so next question is we're really sort of we're going to dive into it now. What did you find interesting about this general election and the lead up to it? What do you think the impact has been on your local area? your peers, or yourself? I, th I think what unfortunately struck me about this election um, was I found there was a sort of like real lack of vision. Um, I felt like most of the election campaign it was more that you were being asked to like vote against something than necessarily for something. And I think that can be like incredibly frustrating when I think everyone in this room is all like very focused on good works and making a difference and it did just sort of feel like you were kind of shouting out into the void and I think it's fair to say that we probably didn't get the most detailed plans on manifestos and that was definitely for political reasons but what I'm hopeful about is I think we now have a government that listens and previous conferences I think it was really hard that we kept making all these ideas, and then when you go to write your MP, it was just sort of, you kind of shouting in the wind. So I'm quite hopeful now going forward that there'll be like a lot more actionable sort of community-led work, and I'd like to think that's because of this new intake of MPs, and I'm hopeful that it'll be quite like a listening house. And I think for conference as well, especially moving on from the theme of just politics, I think going forward, we should have some like really effective sort of like, I don't know, I think we spoke once about like a kind of like mission focused project um, that would be able to make like a sort of real practical difference. So I'd say despite being a bit nervous at the start, I think I am starting to feel a lot more hopeful about what could happen and how the network could like continue to use that platform for common good. I'll stop waffling now. <laughs> Um, I agree with what Michael said about the lack of vision, but I also wanted to add to that and say I saw a lack of humanity. Because um, this was the first time I voted, uh, the first time I was kind of involved in politics. So I did watch a bit of the um, election debate, um, and something that really struck me was kind of the language of it, and how everything seemed so kind of pragmatic. Um, and I. It, I f it felt to me like quite a harmful way in a way that didn't really express my views and kind of what I wanted, how I wanted my government, government to feel and government to care. Um, specifically, it was when they were talking about um, refugees and immigration and the language about that, because um, 
you had um, Rishi Sunak um, talking about sending people off to Rwanda, and you had Starmer talking about sending back people back to their own homes, uh, but you didn't have any humanity in it about the kind of the experiences these people were having, and that really kind of shocked me about the lack, because both sides were just so logical and so cold about everything, and it's like I want. I want policies and politics that consider the humanity of people mm -hmm. and consider um, I am not as clear at making points. I tend to wander a little bit, so I apologize for that in advance. Um, but I think that what I would like to say overall is that it takes for me anyway, a lot of effort, a lot of effort and a lot of um, just tenacity to cling to hope mm -hmm. and optimism. And I honestly feel like it's a battle sometimes. Um, and I think that that's true for a lot of other young people. In fact, I, I know that it is, um, that we're trying really, really hard, um, but that I don't blame other young people who we may look at and think, gosh, you're so apathetic. Um, <laughs> there's a reason, it's, a, it's absolutely a self-protection uh, mechanism. The world is an incredibly scary place, as I'm sure that you know. Um, but I think what I'm trying to say is um, that young people should not necessarily be blamed for their apathy. Um, that it's, it's very scary, but that at the school that um, that I work at, which is a secondary school, we had a mock election uh, where the students voted. Um, you know, they did a mock election, and um, the the Green Party won by nearly a hundred votes. Um, it was an absolute landslide, um, and I take a lot of hope from that. Um, I really do, and this is you know this is a pretty well-to-do area where people are much more. Um, engaged in local politics because they feel like they have more of a voice, but um, I do take courage for that. Um, something I noticed leading up to the election, I had a lot of friends who decided not to vote, um, and their reasoning for it wasn't, I mean it was partly because they didn't feel represented, but a lot of them had almost given up hope and they just felt that uh, they didn't even want to think about it, they just wanted to pretend it wasn't happening and just get on with their lives. Um, and I think it's terrifying to me that we've got to the point where people are thinking like that. Um, so yeah. I'll we'll kind of focus on the impact you had on me, um, because this election allowed so many vulgar languages, it was brazenly open, and one of the parties which you all know, someone actually said when they arrive on our shores, you should shoot them. Yeah. And the name of your party doesn't really um, you know, suggest what you are doing because I would say when you say reform, what are you reforming? Because that's not what you should be saying because um, just like the previous speaker said, um, and she, where does the humanity come in if you're not pushing the lives first. So that, that had an impact on me. And most of my friends or most people who I you know knocked on their doors because I did loads of leafletting and also campaign also. So when you hear the um, residents they're not interested in voting. But as the election drew closer, I saw people who wanted to also now register when you know coming back for the second or the third time to knock on their doors or to you know, leaflet. They said, I think the events of the last week, you know, shaped my decision and I'm going to vote. But why should we leave it to the last end? Why don't we make up our time? So the last government has been in power for a long time or within the last one year, something should actually, you know, inform your decision for the next coming year. We shouldn't leave it to the last, you know, bit of time. 
because of you know one party coming forward and we are having a general election in the next five years. I know I'm too soon saying that, but <laughs> what happens then should start now, right? What informed that decision should start now, which is why as all of us gather there for the conference, we should also help you know shape the mindset of people around us, understand that humanity first and that had an impact on me. Yeah, I, I really I agree with that completely. Um, and I want to bring up the word that um, I think John Battle used and we've all kind of used as well, which was vision. Um, and we're saying there is a lack of vision in our politics. And I think that's the thing that's so inspirational for young people because I know a lot, lots of us can barely remember a time before the Tory government. Um, and I have to admit, that can be pretty crushing. <laughs> Um, so, if I share a really quick story, is that okay? Yeah. Um, so, I, I was having a conversation with my friends about uh, disarmament, um, and we were having a discussion, and it was fantastic. And everyone basically came to the conclusion that, yeah, we shouldn't have nuclear weapons. And that, that was the opinion of everyone on the table I was talking to. Um, and then I said, okay, great, so shouldn't this be what our government does? And then everyone suddenly went, oh no, but we couldn't actually do that. <laughs> and it's, it's this difference between idealism and pragmatism that we were discussing yes, well, earlier today um, and yesterday. Um, and it's, I think the thing that is lacking is this vision to say, actually, some of this idealistic stuff is achievable, but we, we don't see that because we've not experienced that we've not really experienced the politics that says, you know what, maybe we can make a positive difference instead of, oh, we'll just scrape by and we'll just try and get the votes by and being inclusive, being shutting our borders, things like this. Um, so I, I think a serious issue is the lack of vision. And I think that's very closely linked to hope because if there's no vision, what's there to hope for? Just to add, because I forgot to mention it before, so it's not really building on it, um, but that as um, I've attended training for how to uh, help uh, children, particularly with eco-anxiety, um, and one of the things that is really, really important is to try not to have a solutionist mindset, um, to just actually listen to, as, as an adult, to listen to a child saying, I'm scared. Um, and I think that that's something that we, I personally need a bit more um, room for in my life as well. Um, I think hope is obviously incredibly important and I think it's really sad that dystopia has been so mainstream because it stops people from having a vision of what they can look forward to. I don't know if you've heard the quote of like, we find it so easy to imagine the end of the world but we can't imagine the end of capitalism, <laughs> which is, I, I, that, that absolutely blows my mind. Um, but I think that having a space in your heart to hold and express deep fear about the future and to be able to talk about that and experience catharsis with other people is really important, although it can really hurt. Um, because understanding what other people are going through is crucial. Thank you for um, those really insightful answers. Um, just kind of picking up on that idea of, um, of hope and um, a vision and coming to a place of understanding um, and I guess also um, with the whole topic of this conference um, thinking beyond if you can thinking beyond just Westminster um, talking about decision-making um, participation and power dynamics 
what do you guys think just politics looks like? Loaded question. Um, I think one of the big things for me, um, especially with the people that I've met over the last year and working with people seeking sanctuary, is that I'd like to see decision making that involves the people that it impacts, um, where their voice is heard and where their voice is recognised and where they have a say in the things that are going to directly impact them. I think that's the, the most important thing to me. For me, um, just politics um, brings a key word to me, which is accountability, right? I mean, politics is accountable, right? Pure, um, which understand what the people really want, which um, uncovers, right, what the people are saying and, you know, bothers more on their challenges. Let's just talk politics. Let's just know that this is for who will better the lives of the people and enough, just like what the speaker said this afternoon, the government is trying to tilt to the business side now instead of, you know, being more of uh, looking out for the people, but going to the business side of things and just wanting to make profit. So when government goes into that angle, they are leaving just policies, it needs to come back, like the discourse needs to shift and like the centre needs to hold and also come back to what it originally means, like what policies is for the people, by the people, you know. Thank you. Uh, I think for me, what I see like just politics as is a, a listening politics. I think, unfortunately, the, the discourse of like the last 14 years has pushed our politics through something that's more actionable and focused on listening to experts rather than saying, what are the experts? No, don't listen to them. Um, and that extends like communities as well. And I think, again, just to go back to the point about the sort of, we need to think about the next election. To me, this election wasn't the most important election as much as it was talked about in the news. I honestly think the next election will be the one that will decide how this country turns. And it was obvious the Tories were not going to win. Yeah, they did. They wasted too much and they spent their political capital, but what they are really good at is they are really, really effective campaigners. That's what kept them in power so long. And unless we actually see that proper, just listening politics, I mean, you only have to look in Europe, we've got an incredible rise of the far right. We were extremely lucky in France that Marine Le Pen didn't get in. Plus, with Trump in America, there's a genuine fear that, you know, it's, this battle against populism, it, it, it's far from over. And unless we actually have this just politics with a listening government that's involved in the community, I really do fear where this country will vote. So I'm still hopeful, though, that we will see that change and people can learn that politics can be a force for good. But I think it's something that we all have to be aware of, that it's all our duty to keep this sort of just politics in focus and keep the government to account because if we don't, you know, we are at risk of what could happen and I love Lord of the Rings and there's a fantastic Lord of the Rings quote which is, when Gandalf says, you know, it's not the big heroic actions that keep the darkness at bay, it's the everyday acts of ordinary people and I like to think that with proper just politics and listening, it's those everyday people that are at the forefront of those policy decisions. So just really keep focus and think about keeping out the rise of the far right in the UK. Um, I want to say I'm not really sure I do have a real answer of what I think just politics looks like. Um, but I have been, sorry, that's like, I don't have an answer, that's my answer. <laughs> uh, I have been thinking about um, something the last couple of days, and it kind of just stuck with me in the homily. Um, some very specific words were mentioned um, to do with politics, and they were honesty and integrity. And something I learned as part of my A-levels 
that I think is just so interesting, I just wanted to throw it out to you guys, is there's actually, on the government website, there's something called the Seven Principles of Public Office. Um, and two of them are honesty and integrity. <laughs> Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there and also kind of maybe question kind of the ideals of our politics and how closely they align to kind of our social justice goals and also consider whether the ideals that are already in place are being met as well. I think I would also say kind of a bit out of left field but that I think that a just politics should be more fun. <laughs> um, I, um, there is some statistic that I absolutely cannot remember about the incredible effectiveness of learning through play versus learning through more conventional methods. It's, it's a crazy amount more effective. Um, and I think that politics should be serious and there are elements of it that are completely serious but that if we are to engage people in politics and in making the world a better place, um, whether that starts with uh, local community, it has to be fun. Um, and I think the place for fun and laughter and joy, sh there should be more of a place for it. <laughs> I really agree with that. Um, I think a lot of what I feel people have started to be voting for is the silly white blonde man uh, on telly, um, which is why Donald Trump and Boris Johnson have been doing so well. But it's because they're, in a way, funny and they're fun. And so if you can make just politics fun, people are much more likely to vote for it. Yeah, um does anyone else have anything to add? Can I just jump into an anecdote real quick? Um, I was I, I attended a um, an event the other week um, called Call to Action, uh, which was um, run by Citizens UK, um, and I'm really sorry, Chantel, if I'm stealing something from uh, your session tomorrow, but um, basically uh, the, these great great. Um, uh, young people in schools um, sort of going through the process of community organising um, and um, campaigning for issues that, that are close to them, close to their community. And um, one of the things that stuck out to me there was um, one, of the, one of the recommendations for campaigning and for even protesting is just make it fun. Don't like. Uh, otherwise, you end up getting portrayed as angry, upset protesters. Um, and yeah, I think that's that's really stuck with me. So, um, yeah. And now moving on to a slightly um, different question. Um, and uh, we've kind of we we've kind of been chatting about this one. Um, sort of yesterday evening um, and I think a bit of early this morning um, before we went to bed. Um, <laughs> um, the bar was closed by that point. Um, but it was, the, the, the question is, is how does your faith inform your engagement with politics? Um, and uh, it's a bit of a sensitive question um, but I think just um, some of the answers were, um, the, or, or some of the things we spoke about last night, and um, I won't give too much away, because <laughs> obviously you're supposed to answer these questions. Um, but um, yeah, I think, um, I think it's really interesting, some of the perspectives that, that I've heard at least, um, and uh, yeah, who wants to go first? How does your faith inform your engagement with politics? Um, well, has it affected um, how you voted? Obviously, first time voters. Um, did your faith or your values have any 
kind of uh, influence on that. Um, and um, being here, being here is, I would say, inherently political. Attending a conference called Just Politics. And uh, has your faith influenced that in any way? I think I, I always think of the MP John McDonnell, um, who says he's never ever read a word of Marx, but he's only read uh, the, like, the Bible. And his whole like, perspective on politics, he calls it like Christian uh, socialism. And I, I sometimes feel like I, I have a, a sort of like complicated relationship with the Catholic Church because I, I very, very much believe in Catholic social teaching and the good works. And I know for a fact that like my current viewpoints and perspectives have been formed by that. And, my God, like especially attending conference for the past 20 years, uh, like that has played a huge part. All the vegetarian meals, they all help me. Uh, but it's not like an all meat though, that was, I was surprised by that, but, uh, <laughs> but um, I, I know for a fact that that's definitely formed, especially meeting all you folks, uh, without a doubt, like I, I, I can't deny that. I think where I feel like, I think we've all said like it felt complicated is we all care very strongly about social issues and I think it's fair to say that the church has been problematic in some of those issues, the way it addresses it and the way maybe it gets into like camps about things. Like we talk a lot about sort of trying to like disagree agreeably and, and I think we need to think about how we can also see that like at a church level as well. And it's hard as a someone like in your yeah or like from a lay background because it, it can feel that you, you can't really change much. Um, but I know the one thing that does change it is actual the faith of just some peace people and everyone here and the good works that carries out and yeah that, that definitely influenced what a box I was taking put it that way. <laughs> the way my faith um impacts my involvement in politics. I think born Catholic, credo Catholic, I understand fully well um, the church is involved in politics because yeah, as a church, um, the church wouldn't form a political party. No, it is the members of the church who are part and parcel of those parties. So um, it is a duty of care to understand that it is my civic responsibility and duty to be involved in politics um, and also to uphold, you know, justice, fairness, you know, uprightness in what I'm doing, in deciding who is to lead, and to also bring also um, the challenges. And also, if I'm to run for a political office or if I'm in a situation where um, a political leader is listening to me, I have to also let them know. This is my viewpoint and this is why I'm saying this because my faith is largely involved in this decision. So um, in a nutshell I'm saying um, my faith is a pass and pass of what I do daily which involves um, my lifestyle, politics and everything. So um, I, it's a sine qua non I can't do without it. So it is, yeah. My um, my participation in politics has been wholly formed by uh, my Catholic upbringing, um, and like a lot of people here, you know, being a raging feminist and a Catholic, a, a bit um, <laughs> it's, it's real rough. <laughs> I'm trying to hold that paradox in my head and still feel okay. Um, it's very very difficult. Um, but like many people here, as Michael was mentioning, um, my beliefs about Catholic social teaching are fundamental to who I am um, because that's how I was raised. And I think that, uh, like uh, Bishop Gooley was talking, it's kind of my, it's a shared language that I have with a whole group of people. Um, and I think that's really, really important. Um, and I feel like there's more I can do within the church than I can do um, outside of it. Um, my father 
and my mother have been very involved in uh, justice and peace, and it's kind of what I know. Um, and I would like to go off on a small anecdote <laughs> as well, if that's okay, um, about <coughs> someone who I follow on Instagram, because uh, social media can be excellent. Um, it can be really, really good. I know that there's a lot about it that's bad, but it can be pretty phenomenal. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Michaela Lodge. Um, she's, a, she's a phenomenal climate activist. I really, really recommend that you, um, that you follow her. Um, but she talks about mycelium. I don't know if you guys know about mycelium. It's kind of... Yeah. <laughs> it's the underground uh, kind of root system of a fungus, essentially. Um, and when you see a mushroom kind of pop up um, in the forest, you, you're kind of like, where on earth did this come from? Um, but it's been this nourishing root system um, that has been going for years and years and years. Um, and Michaela Loach kind of encourages this way of looking at our work, our shared work, as mycelium underground. And she uses the example of um, the blocking of the Cambo oil field. Um, that we were successful in getting that in getting that blocked after a really really long time, but that the roots of that work go back hundreds of years into work that people did that didn't quote unquote yield mushrooms. It, there wasn't a big mushroom of hey we've stopped Cambo. It was forming those networks like this Justice and Peace conference that don't yield mushrooms, but they eventually kind of do down the line. And I kind of see that as a lot of the work that you guys have done, um, of the older generation, <laughs> um, that hopefully we can now build on. Um, and that doesn't really answer the question, but I wanted to get the mycelium in there because I think it's a really powerful, <laughs> I think it's a really powerful, great metaphor that really, I, I really love. So sorry. <laughs> your engagement with politics, I think very often it's the other way around for me, um, um, it's, it's all a bit messy. Um, very often it's rooted in Catholic social teaching, uh, I think that's something we all share. Um, it's, it's amazing things like the preferential option for the poor mm -hmm. and the common good, which where on earth are you going to hear about them anywhere else? <laughs> um, it's something that people don't talk about when they really should. And to be honest, reading the Green Manifesto, it was very, I, I think that might have been the first manifesto I've read that maybe does touch on the common good. It was very exciting stuff. Um, but um, yeah, that's, that's all to say, I think the only faith I could have would be political. I think if it, if it wasn't, it's not something I could endorse. Um, and yeah, because both have developed together, I think. Um, so without my faith being hollow, it, it has to be political. I must, must it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd like to add on that a bit. I kind of share that feeling. Um, and I'll just say that kind of activism and my faith are just completely intertwined. I mean, I'd say that um, I go on marches, I do charity work, I do all that because I'm Catholic, and I'm Catholic because it allows me to do those things uh, and make those connections. Yeah. Speaking of the importance of making connections, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mycelium connections, there you go. Um, that's how it was relevant. Thank you. Um, uh, okay, what final question here before we take some questions from the audience. What do people need to do in your experience, in your opinion? What do people need to do over the next five years 
to actively participate in politics. I think going back to what you said about Michaela Loach, I think she's a brilliant example of what was mentioned earlier about making politics fun and engaging young people um, in a way that's creative and through social media. And I think, especially currently, there's a lot of fear of the unknown around social media and kind of fear of the misinformation and disinformation that's spread, which is absolutely a real worry. But I think it can absolutely also be used as a tool for good. And I think she's a great example of that um, with like more serious content as well as sharing kind of the more fun side of it and actually issues that young people care about can apply to how they vote and they do have a say in, in politics and they do have a voice that can be used. She, she is also a Christian. Mm, yeah. And she talks about how her faith influences her radical um, content. Um, to your question, what people need to do um, in the next five years, you know, just keep, you know, to keep the government accountable, right, to always ensure that they stay in line, they're doing the right thing, calling them out, also um, in our own, you know, communities, local groups, focus groups, wherever we find ourselves, we just need to keep, um, keep talking about it, um, keep the candle burning, keep the voice, you know, allowed, keep talking about all this because what the government wants or a government that doesn't want to do what the people want, what the government, their mindset is they want the people to be calm, to keep quiet, to not talk about all these things so that they could go scot-free. But when we keep talking about them, you see, we keep being in line, just like we say, just policies. Just politics is going to come about when we are ensuring that they are doing that, which is for the good of the people. So I think it's more of um, don't don't let this thing go off. Keep it on, yeah, for the next five years. Um. So I'm going to sort of not start by answering the question. I'm going to say five years ago um, was the last time I came to the Justice and Peace Conference and then the pandemic hit and this is the first time I've been back. Um, and I think during that time, during the pandemic, I lost my engagement in politics completely. Um, politicians just became silly figures to laugh at. Um, and I, I, almost, I wasn't really thinking about what I was doing, um, who I was voting for, um, it was more just whatever around me was voting for. Um, and I guess coming to this conference has started to make me think um, a lot more. Um, and I'm starting to realise now how little I was engaging before. And um, it's motivated me to um, engage in politics more over the next few years. Um, so I just want to thank you all for that. Um, and yeah, in terms of what we can do in the next five years, um, I think if other young people who have lost their interest can have a similar experience to this, if we can get them to events and sort of get them to think um, about the world, then maybe they'll have more motivation uh, to engage to make a difference. I know um, one thing I want to start doing is start attending constituency meetings. Uh, that's something like a lot of always been a keen follower of politics. I've never actually attended a constituency meeting. Um, and I think what would be nice, I think right now we're sort of in a politics of like healing. And even just at like that very simplistic, like basic democratic level, I think just turning up to meetings as like the individuals that we all are, providing those viewpoints, being able to network, just from that grassroots level, um, I know for me that's something that I'd like to do and I think maybe going forward so we can all have a go out because I think 
politics has been bloody horrible for like so long that it would be nice to actually be part of a democratic process that is more positive. And the beautiful thing, if we all have that idea, is that we will actually start to see that like genuine representation that you can meet with people, talk to people, you know, whatever their background. I think it's the sort of return of community that we need. We've promoted the individual for a very long time now. And just something really simple, like just turn up, like at a constituency, meeting your neighbours, constituents, providing your own voice for just some peace. If everyone did that, I mean, what, 650 constituencies? I don't know how many have attended a conference here today, but if we could even just get one of us in each constituency being that voice, doing that networking, yeah, I still am hopeful. And need to think about that next election. <laughs> and kind of community and communication because something I noticed a lot in my friends was the lack of trust and kind of faith and belief in authority figures so all my friends were voting for the first time you know they, they, they tried to do research and they kind of knew what each party stood for they just didn't believe them or didn't trust that they were going to do anything they said they did so I think part of what we need to do moving forward is because uh, that lady this morning, she's talking, you know, and it kind of restored my faith in politicians a little bit, that talk, but my friends haven't seen that. They just, there's just no trust there. Um, so I think that's something we need, really need to work on, is that kind of communication and building up that trust. Yeah, isn't, isn't it exciting that um, politicians can actually do things successfully and discovered <laughs> and quickly? Wow, it's very refreshing. <laughs> Um, and I think that's that's a shift in mindset for me. It's been very quickly since the election. Suddenly, oh, oh, this is what politics could be like. Um, and um, I think there's something something key um, that the next five years could kind of bring about. The next, yeah, um, I think the sort of mindless, automatic, default pragmatism that we have. It's kind of oh well, nothing can change and. This sort of it, it kind of leads to this apathy. Um, I think that shouldn't be the default. I, I think we should have, especially as as kind of as, as Catholics as, as faith, we we should have a default of hope. Um, I think that's and that's something that we should carry into politics. Um, and I think that's a really strong way to kind of keep combating this apathy that's been developing over the last few years. Just say, well, actually, we've got reason to be hopeful. Um, I think that, that would make it very exciting the next couple of years. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. Um,